Hey guys, Josh here from SIBO Survivor. I'm super excited to bring you another episode where I feature someone by the name of John Brisson. I found him on his blog called FixYourGut.com and I wanted to reach out to him and kind of get him on the show so that we could discuss his background, how he got into helping fix people with gut issues, as well as his, his knowledge specifically in this episode on hydrogen sulfide SIBO. Just because I was going through his site and I saw some really good information and research on you know, dealing with hydrogen sulfide, what you can do, what specific steps you can take to help this issue. Um, so I wanted to get him on the show and I got him here today. Um, awesome guy. We're going to give you some specific actionable steps if you're dealing with hydrogen sulfide and you know, lots more good information coming from John. So let's get to it. So hey guys, I'm I'm with John. Uh, how do you say your, how do you pronounce your name correctly? Uh, Brisson, John Brisson. Brisson. So hey, I'm with John Brisson today, and I'm super excited to be here. Uh, I found him from his blog FixYourGut.com, and I, the reason I wanted to contact him was because he had some interesting information on hydrogen sulfide SIBO and a lot of different research and findings that a lot of other bloggers and sites out there kind of weren't diving into. So I'm excited to kind of talk to John about his experience, what got him into this, and just a bunch of different details that can help people out. So um, Thank you for having me very much, Josh. Yeah, so can you just give um, anyone out there who doesn't know you just a little brief background, um, you know, what you do for work, what some of your hobbies, passions are? Yes. Um, well, I, uh, John Brisson, I live in uh, Fayetteville, North Carolina. I've lived here all my life. Um, my primary job is Fix Your Gut. It's been that way for seven years. Um, I originally worked at the vitamin shop uh, before. Um, I, I made pri Fix Your Gut primarily my main job, but um, my, uh, my uh, second son was born with a genetic uh, disorder that required me to stay home and help take care of him, so I started doing Fix Your Gut primarily since then. Wow. Um, you know, trying to write books, blogs, trying to coach and help people with their, their gut issues, um, hobbies, yeah, I still play video games Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> a little bit since I was a kid, you know, I guess with my age of being 30, 32, you know, it's pretty common and watch wrestling, I guess, for me, being born in the South. And I do like to read a lot and read a lot of, uh, fiction, Dean Koontz and nonfiction too. I can't tell you how many books on the gut and how many studies yeah. <laughs> I've read over the years too. Yeah. Uh, and everything like that, but you know, it's 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 a passion of mine too. I was initially sick myself. Yeah. Uh, many people in my family, uh, both my parents died when I was young. They also had wow. uh, health conditions too as well. Uh, my father had hepatitis. He was actually one of the first in the United States diagnosed with it in the late eighties. Uh, wow. My mom had systemic lupus, um, and you know, I, I just dealt with a lot of hardship and a lot of sick and a lot of sickness, a lot of trauma uh, throughout my whole entire life, and I just tired of people being ill. You know, it's. It's tough. It's a tough world that we live, modern world that we live in today. Yeah, it's definitely tough, and I can relate to that just because anyone, like a lot of my followers and people who see this, you know, they're just they're trying to find something that helps their body, right? Like get back, and sometimes the conventional medical system just doesn't solve that problem for them. So it's really an issue. Um, yeah, very much so. I mean, my grandpa was a pharmacist, and he I was raised, you know, the conventional medicine was the right way to go until it fa failed me later on when no one could tell me what was wrong with me when my gut was bad. Yeah, exactly. So I just want to dive into a little bit more about, like, what – so I know you had your personal issues as well as some stuff in your family um, going on with the health crisis. So what really got you into researching and then helping people, creating your site and – kind of getting into more of just in particular the gut as well. So give me a little background. Well, myself, I got sick about eight years ago, uh, which what I later discovered through my own research uh, was H. pylori, yeah. uh, infection of my upper gut, stomach, and the duodenum. Um, it caused me to develop silent reflux, which was relatively unknown at the time. Uh, most people have known as standard acid reflux, but silent reflux was definitely your gas average gastroenterologist was unaware of it. Most uh, um throat specialists, ENT doctors, and stuff like that, they, they were knowledgeable of it. So um, I tried to work through that myself, and then the reason why I started Fix Your Gut initially was was a lot of the bulletproof forums, helping people out, answering questions and stuff like that, with the knowledge that I had to supplements at the time. Yeah. And I met my business partner, uh, Titus Wilson, on there. His sister was ill, and I'd helped her 
uh, you know, recover health and get better. And then from there, he was like, you know, people in the forums and Titus was like, hey, why don't you write a book and we can start a website, you know, start Fix Your Gut and everything like that. And, have a place where you can put together all your, you know, all the information that you have read over the past years and stuff like that. So I said, sure, why not? So I started doing that and I started coaching people too as well. And I've been doing this full time, I guess now for five years. Wow. Um, trying to help people as much as I can and try to put up as much accurate information as well. Yeah. And, and you know, there's definitely a need because I feel like there's a lot of people, especially I don't know what it is, maybe the advent of antibiotics or the different, you know, the society we live in, but a lot of people are having issues with their gut now, which is unfortunate. So there is like a need for understanding and people to help, you know, coach them along the way too. Very much, Josh. I mean, I would actually, I would, I definitely agree with you. It's weird how people, of course, had gut issues in the past, you know, but it seemed to be more acute gut issues than chronic gut issues that lasted them, you know, for very long periods of time. And when it comes to conventional medicine, conventional medicine does very well with acute issues, you know, surgery, uh, broken arm, broken bones, trauma, yeah. car accidents, and so forth and so on, but not very good with chronic, chronic or systemic disease. Yeah, yeah, totally agree. It's more of like a traumatic, you know, you know, you break your skull or your arm and you need, you know, and you need to repair that. Like it doesn't, I feel like the conventional medical system wasn't designed as well for chronic issues or issues that occur over a longer period of time, so. Correct. Yeah. So, um, what is your experience? I know you, you do coaching on your site. So what's kind of your experience helping people with SIBO or IBS type symptoms? Because that's what my site is about. And a lot of my audience is dealing with SIBO or, you know, an issue of a bacterial overgrowth or a dysbiosis, right? Yes. Um, there's many different, uh, types of SIBO that have come out in medical literature and people have talked about on SIBO Facebook group and other boards and podcasts and Pretty much you can divide it into at least three known classes that we know of, which is SIBO with uh, constipation, which is yeah. caused by methane-dominant archaea. Mm-hmm. Uh, SIBO, uh, diarrhea SIBO, which is hy- standard hydrogen-based. And then you have hydrogen sulfide, which is the third type of SIBO, which is, is, is not very much well-known. There's not a lot of studies out there. There's not a lot of research. Allison Seidbecker talks about it every so often. Yeah. Uh, Pimatel, not so much. He's kind of hung up on... Uh, Methane SIBO or SIBO with constipation currently work on his medication, which is a uh, statin lactone. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, most people come to me with the standard symptoms of SIBO, but differing, it can differing in the type that they have. So someone with SIBO with diarrhea, for example, will come to me with severe bloating, diarrhea, abdominal cramps, loss of weight from malnutrition, or someone with constipation will come to me with severe constipation. They actually may gain a little bit of weight initially and eventually lose it. Severe bloating, uh, where hydrogen sulfide, it can range from severe crippling brain fog from the hydrogen sulfide um, yeah. getting into the bloodstream and irritating, you know, infl- inflaming the brain, or severe body odor, severe halitosis, yeah. severe flatulence that smells like sulfur. Uh, so the symptoms can range, you know, depending on what type of SIBO a person has um, very strongly. And... Hopefully, we'll get more research in the future, especially with hydrogen sulfide, mm-hmm. uh, the third type of SIBO, uh, more research so we can lock down exactly what's going on and why it seems to be occurring for a lot of people. Yeah, exactly. And just also, you know, as as the you know microbiome research, you know, continues to improve, right? Hopefully, we have a better understanding of like what the exact diversity we're looking for and all those different things, because I think that'll be a really important factor in getting some better health outcomes in the future as well. I agree. There's so much that we unknown about the microbiome that I feel that we almost just scratched the surface. Yeah, totally agree. Um, so I want to kind of dive into hydrogen sulfide um, kind of in this chat just because it's it's relatively unknown. And I just want to, I think people who suffer with hydrogen sulfide, like I myself have, that's when I was really sick, I mainly struggle with that. Um, it's tough because like you said, there's not a lot of research out there and it's one of those things that like people don't know even what supplements they can take to kind of help it or anything like that. So um, my first question is really when you see or you're, you're coaching someone or you run into someone and, and they kind of present with hydrogen sulfide SIBO or what does that kind of symptom set look like? And, you know, what does that what does that person look like, really? Well, for most people with hydrogen sulfide SIBO or hydrogen sulfide upper gut overgrowth like H. pleura, like myself, 
Um, it usually manifests itself in the this, this, this same manner. Usually the person has a very sulfurous or almost like a rotten egg smell of death, yeah. like flatulence <laughs> or, or, or breath or even body odor. If it, I've seen it severe enough in some cases. Um, people could deal with chronic fatigue syndrome, could be dealing with a lot of fatigue from the hydrogen sulfide causing mitochondrial issues. Uh, severe brain fog, usually a, a reaction to the all food or sulfur containing foods like broccoli and, and eggs. You'll see a huge, you know, people say that they'll ingest these foods and it may bloat them or yeah. may cause them to have severe brain fog. Or if they eat even foods that may contain other FODMAPs but are low sulfur, they don't necessarily have a reaction to, which makes it seem to be strongly correlated to, you know, the, the bacteria in the microbiome producing a lot of hydrogen sulfide um, from, from sulfur, uh, the sort of sulfides that they come in contact with through ingestion. Yeah. Um, so usually those are the symptoms you see. You might see bloating. You might see fibromyalgic type pain. Uh, some people can develop leaky gut, of course. Yeah. Um, usually those are the symptoms that you see uh, yeah. with people with hydrogen sulfide overgrowth. Definitely. And I can personally attest to this. It's like, it can be one of the most embarrassing um, overgrowths that there is just because of the gas that you get and, you know, sometimes your breath and all those things. It's really, like, it's troubling, man. It reminds me of uh, the movie. Uh, it was one of the Bell Brooks movies where they were sitting around the campfire and they were eating beans. Yeah. And everybody was having horrible flatulence yeah. and eating, eating beans and stuff like yeah. that. I mean, it reminds, me, it reminds me of that, of how bad it can make everything smell. I mean... It, hydrogen sulfide overgrowth has been linked to um, inflammatory bowel disease yeah. being uh, a, a kind of a secondary overgrowth to MAP. Um, and I mean, ranging from stomach cancer, du duodenal cancer, from H. pylori. I mean, it's definitely something that affects a lot of people that isn't really talked about a lot yeah. on, on you know, the civil world. And especially when people come... Usually the diagnostic marker for for, um, for hydrogen sulfide SIBO is a flatline test. Yeah. A person will get a hydrogen uh, or a methane uh, uh, breath test done usually with lactulose. Um, yeah. And it'll come back zero across the board. And yeah. the person's like, well, why? And yeah. Usually because okay, so a person has to be producing some amount of methane or hydrogen, it would be... Uh, very detrimental if they weren't in their gut, <laughs> gut would be completely messed up but yeah it'll manifest itself as a flat line because hydrogen sulfide is what mainly is being produced there and it's just not being measured yeah um and you when we look at the gut there's five main gases that are produced that we know of it's nitrogen carbon dioxide methane hydrogen and hydrogen sulfide of course hydrogen sulfide is the gas that's produced by our microorganisms in our gut that's supposed to be the lowest concentration uh, yeah. because even though our body does need a little bit of hydrogen sulfide certain things like blood vessel relaxation we don't need a lot of it obviously and a lot of it causes a lot of problems i mean for mitochondria for energy to to um to issues with brain fog it's, it's when it get an abundance of it and leaks out of the gut that's when we have major issues with that type of overgrowth yeah definitely and it's you know it's an area that I, I kind of don't get, we need more research just because like, uh, you know, it's, it's one of the most embarrassing and can be the most, one of the most severe types of overgrowth. And that's why I don't understand why there isn't as much research. It kind of, you know, befuddles me. But, um, so basically you were talking about, usually it's, it's in the bacteria colonizes your upper gut. Can you kind of explain that maybe a little more? Okay. Yeah. I'm. Josh, I think I'm one of the few people that are differentiating the microbiome between the two. I mean, we yeah. have organisms that live in what I call the upper gut, which is the mouth, which, you know, a lot of people will get hydrogen sulfide overgrowth in the mouth. I mean, it's yeah. been correlated with dental caries and, of course, yeah. halitosis, yeah. which is bad breath. And the esophagus, the stomach, and the duodenum are usually what I consider to be the upper gut. I yeah. know the duodenum is part of the small intestine, but I kind of differentiate it a little bit between the ileum and the gingium, which is primarily SIBO. Yeah. Um, now, it, you also generally have issues if you have an upper gut bacteria or parasite or or yeast overgrowth. It also affects the pancreas, the, the gallbladder, and then the liver too as well to some degree. Yeah. Um, so there's certain organisms that, I mean, for years we thought the stomach was sterile. 
Um, and, you know, come to find out it's not even close. The stomach has a very strong mi- yeah. microbiome. Yeah. Uh, generally, if it's probiotic, hopefully it's lactobacillus in a lot of ways. Mm-hmm. Um, but, yeah, there's, it seems that a lot of these hydrogen sulfide organisms, granted some of them do colonize the colon and the small intestine, a lot of them, especially the what we call the strict overgrowth, like Citrobacter, H. pylori, Protus marimbalis, yeah. um, a lot of those colonize the upper gut, the stomach, the duodenum. Um, so some people can have, you know, hydrogen sulfide SIBO, but some people like myself could have an upper gut overgrowth of, high, of H. pylori in the stomach, but yeah. also have methane dominant archaea uh, or SIBO of constipation as a secondary overgrowth. Interesting. Yeah, that's very interesting. That that makes it even more complicated, right? Because yes. if you have H. pylori and you have methane archaea bacteria in your small intestine, then it's like, you know, the, where do you go from there? That's where it gets complicated. Um, So, I mean, let's say someone's coming to you for help um, and they kind of present with the classic hydrogen sulfide symptoms. Maybe they're having some of that gas. Maybe they're telling you that it's, they're feeling it mostly in their upper gut. Um, I mean, what is your first thought like about anything that can help these people and, um, you know, any recommended tests you would suggest or treatment ideas or, you know, what would you suggest? So, Josh, the, the three main tests that we have currently for hydrogen sulfide, to, I guess, to determine it, um, is, first of all, the standard lactulose hydrogen methane blood, uh, breath test, should I say. They're yeah. working on a hydrogen sulfide breath test as well. Yeah. Uh, and in some places, you can get it, depending on the research hospital uh, that, you, that you go to, for, some people go to for breath testing. Uh, but it's not mainstream currently right now. Yeah. Um, so the second way we have is kind of crude, but it works very well. It's called a bismuth loading test, or what they call a sulfur loading test. So anyway, when someone takes the mineral bismuth, which the most common preparation for bismuth is Pepto-Bismol that yeah. you can go buy over the counter at yeah. any pharmacy, uh, bismuth binds to hydrogen sulfide and it forms bismuth sulfate, which is this black metallic-looking powder. Mm-hmm. So generally, when someone has hydrogen sulfide overgrowth, if they take a dose of Pepto-Bismol and eat sulfur-containing foods like broccoli and eggs, and their stool turns black, yeah. then that's usually a good sign that they're dealing with hydrogen sulfide-type overgrowth yeah. uh, in their gut. Uh, the third way is a urine test, uh, which has been being sold right now as a TH1, TH2 uh, uh, cytokine differentiation test, where you can just search for hydrogen sulfide urine test. Okay. Um, I don't recommend it as much um, because, yes, it is true that if you did have an overgrowth of hydrogen sulfide bacteria, uh, the metabolites that they uh, produce, you know, an excess of hydrogen sulfide in in, in the gut, eventually you would eliminate some of it through using the bathroom, through urinating. Yeah. But it's just not, we just don't know. We We have no standard of measurement for that testing yet. Yeah. Uh, so generally, those are the three ways to test for it. I mean, outside of the most common thing, which means generally, if your body odor or flatulence or your breath smells, you know, yeah, reeks of sulfur. Exactly. It's probably your, it's probably an issue that you're dealing with. Yeah. Um, so usually, the way you go about tackling it is if it's some sort of upper gut overgrowth like H. pylori, you would tackle the H. pylori itself. If there's any underlying SIBO going on, whether it's hydrogen based, whether you know you're having diarrhea. Or where you're having constipation with methane dominant or K, you also want to tackle that too at the same time. Yeah. Uh, supplements that you can use to maybe bind up uh, the hydrogen sulfide that may want to be bismuth, whether it's uh, Pepto Bismol or Bismuth Subgallant, which is Devrom, to yeah. see if that helps relieve some of the symptoms. Uh, the mineral molybdenum is very important uh, for uh, sulfur metabolism by the body because it's used by the body to produce uh, the enzymes that are needed to break down sulfur okay. uh, which may help if you had an abundance of hydrogen sulfide if you take the molybdenum it may help release some of your symptoms like brain fog and fatigue you know and the last thing that i recommend uh most people with hydrogen sulfide to do is to go on a low theol diet to go on a low sulfur diet and if you search that in google there's plenty of different yeah uh, diets the best ones put out by a- andrew cutler uh, the living uh, protocol. So, I mean, I definitely would suggest someone with hydrogen sulfide uh, SIBO or hydrogen sulfide upper gut overgrowth to go on a low thiol diet to reduce the amount of hydrogen sulfides to produce as being produced by the microbiome to see if they feel any better. 
Awesome. Yeah, that's those are good, you know, steps that people can take, right? I think even just trying the diet and then also like you said, like testing out bismuth to see if your stool like most of the time your stool would turn black, right? Is that kind of what you see? Yeah. Yes, I mean, I've seen it so bad in some people where they've had so much bad, so much, their, their overgrowth in their mouth was so bad yeah. that their teeth had a black film on them. Wow, that's really from interesting. The wow, that's interesting. Yeah, so that's that's really like a, a quick way to tell if that's something you might be dealing with, I think. Um, and bismuth also has an antimicrobial effect to it as well. It's very yeah. good for upper gut overgrowth like H. pylori. Yeah, because that's what I was going to say. I've actually seen, I've read some of the studies that say they use bismuth and saw like a 95% reduction in hydrogen sulfide, right? Something like that. Yeah, it works um, very well. It reduces the overgrowth and it binds up the hydrogen sulfide. It's a win-win yeah. scenario for both issues. Yeah, so my next question then would be like, so, you know, you, you figure out that you're dealing with maybe a hydrogen sulfide overgrowth, um, figure out if you're dealing with H. pylori. Um, and then, you know, you talked about some of the different options you can do, but like, as far as kind of keeping it away, that's always the challenge, right? Like what if, I mean, what, what have you found as far as like treating it and kind of maintaining that, right? That's now that's a more difficult question, yeah, Josh, because yeah. a lot of people, they fall back into when they have these chronic overgrowths, they fall back into a cycle where they might beat it down or something else either takes its place or the hydrogen sulfide overgrowth returns itself once a person gets off a protocol. Yeah. It doesn't always happen, but it happens quite frequently. I mean, SIBO is a vicious cycle. A yeah. lot of these gut overgrowths are a vicious cycle. Definitely. Um, so generally what you want to do is kind of limit a theol diet for some time. It doesn't necessarily have to be a low FODMAP diet, just a low theol diet to, to limit hydrogen sulfide production. Yeah. Uh, of course, sunlight exposure for vitamin D is, is paramount for recovery for most people with gut issues because most people with gut issues have low vitamin D to begin with. And yeah. supplementation of vitamin D just doesn't work out very well, whether it's a genetical issue with the VDR receptors or just absorption from the intestinal tract as well. I mean, we do know that sunlight exposure itself reduces inflammation. There are studies where it can help to close the tight gut junctions and to relieve leaky gut, as well as to help the immune system too, as well, recognize yeah. pathogens. Um, and I mean, it also depends on what type of SIBO a person is dealing with, whether it's constipation. Most important thing you always want to do is make sure that your bowels are moving properly yeah. uh, with SIBO with constipation. And SIBO with diarrhea, what you want to do is kind of Re reduce the toxin load that a person has, whether supplementing with activated charcoal or or or, um, or bentonite clay, yeah. to see if that'll help uh, slow down the MMC a little bit without um, causing a toxin retention. Doing things like that, um, I've seen paramount to, to help with people to, to, to recover from it. Interesting, yeah, and it's a good point that you mentioned about the vitamin D because I've actually noticed too, right? Like when sometimes when you are sick like you feel like you know you just want to kind of lay inside right but like sometimes yes. the lack of sunlight the lack of you know exposure to the environment like is is harmful you need to kind of expose your body to sunlight and get that necessary vitamin d because it's so important i definitely agree josh and if i can stress one thing you know it's to the listeners is that that was the biggest thing that made the biggest difference in my health recovery wow was proper sunlight exposure. It, okay. it, it really did. It turned everything around for me. I cannot express enough of this importance in today's modern world yeah. where we all stay inside. We work indoor jobs. Yeah. And, you know, our ancestors, we've been getting sun since man, <laughs> since man was put on the earth. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah. it, it's been since the dawn of time. We've got sunlight exposure. Now we think that we can avoid it you know, and live our modern lives. And I, I myself, I, you know, I got sun as a child and I never really had too many gut issues. I had asthma and allergies, which I guess you could link that to the gut, of course. Yeah. But it wasn't like when I got each flora years in my early adulthood, where during that time period, I never saw the sun. So, yeah, that's interesting. I think the more we learn, the more we learn that we need to kind of get back to our roots as well as like find out how to blend our new technological advances, right? Like, being able to chat on the computer right now is amazing, but we also have to remember that like it's important to get sunlight to, you know, you know, work with the earth. <laughs> Very much so, uh, Josh. I mean, it ranges from people grounding or people walking outside of nature, which stress itself has been shown to reduce gut issues. And, yeah, and also eating a clean diet as much as possible, possibly organic food if you can afford it. 
Um, you know, all those things can help better one's health and better help one's digestive issues too as well. Definitely. Um, so do you see, um, you know, a lot of people with SIBO have been shown to have motility issues. Do you see that a lot? And do you, you know, do you use prokinetics? Do you work on that? Or do you, you know, suggest those? Very much so. I mean, yeah. it's interesting with hydrogen sulfide overgrowth. When you look at the literature, a majority of people, at least in the literature, say they have SIBO with diarrhea. Yeah. Um, which I think is true with initial cases. But most people that I coach, including myself, yeah. uh, I, I had constipation issues with yeah. my hydrogen sulfide. It wasn't yeah. primarily diarrhea related. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I definitely... Of course, with constipation, the MMC is crucial, the migrating motor complex. You want to make sure that stool is moving through the digestive tract in an orderly fashion. You know, make sure your stomach acid's good. Make sure that bile isn't sluggish and it's being released properly. Yeah. You get all these toxins out to reduce the overgrowth. I mean, you have all these issues of, of why you want motility. So food will ferment in the colon and it will cause more overgrowth issues. Yeah. So, I mean, definitely, I use the prokinetics. It's controversial, you know? Yeah. I mean, the prescription prokinetics we have, uh, most of them are, are yeah, they're, are crap. Yeah, they're, they're not, not that good, anything. yeah. They have yeah. a lot of side effects um, and they don't really work very well. And a lot of our natural prokinetics, they do help. Trifala works very well. Uh, ginger works very good for, uh, for emptying out the stomach, but it can slow down motility in the intestinal tract. Yeah. Um, I usually recommend magnesium to help try to draw water into the colon. Mm-hmm. Only eating three meals a day so that you have that proper MMC function going yeah. on. It's not inter- interrupted through frequent meals. Using a squatty potty. Yeah. Um, exercising or using a rebound trampoline to get the intestines moving too as well. Yeah. All those are very important uh, things to try to help work the MMC, which is crucial because for a lot of people, that may be why some of us got sick in the first place is our motility just was not great. And, yeah. you know, I mean, that is one of the most common causes of appendicitis is from a lack of proper motility. Um, so it's interesting of how when we're dealing with SIBO of constipation or SIBO of hydrogen sulfide, you know, we can even talk about that. We expel hydrogen sulfide too, as well, through our stool and through our flatulence. Yeah. So if we, if that's slowed down, we're holding this massive toxic load of bacterial toxins, yeast toxins, you know, parasitical toxins, whatever overgrowth a person has. On top of that, you're also dealing with these trapped gases, especially hydrogen sulfide. You do not want that to leak into the bloodstream, so yeah. causing mitochondrial issues and everything. So. Definitely, you want to work on your migrating motor complex to make sure that it's not too fast. You don't want to have diarrhea where you're going five or six times a day, which that has its own issue with malnutrition. But you also don't want it to be too slow either. For the most people, I recommend going at least once a day. Two yeah. to three times a day is probably more close to being optimal. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, so just kind of in summary here let's say someone out there you know has you know an abnormal flatline breath test or they're presenting with hydrogen sulfide symptoms um what are some kind of takeaway recommendations you know um if you're dealing with hydrogen sulfide SIBO, yeah the first thing first is you want to try bismuth yeah uh, to see if that alleviates your symptoms and see if that helps with your overgrowth. You definitely want to do a low thiol or low sulfur diet to see if that helps with your symptoms as well. Yeah. Supplementing with molybdenum to see if that helps break down sulfur. You want to tackle the SIBO that you're dealing with or the upper gut overgrowth that you're dealing with like H. pylori because usually that's what causes these hydrogen sulfide issues mainly are bacteria that are overgrown in our digestive tract where they should not be and yeah. produce hydrogen sulfide. Yeah. So you definitely want to take care of that. I mean, and also make, maintaining proper motility as well is something yeah. that's very paramount. Definitely. And the last thing I want to say, Josh, is make sure you're getting sunlight. I know it's difficult in the winter, even with me living in North Carolina, it's pretty much done for me yeah. uh, to be able to get vitamin D until about February or, or March. But definitely in the summer, you want to make that one of your crucial things to do is make sure that you're getting enough proper sunlight exposure you know it only takes about depending on where you live uh anywhere between 15 to 20 minutes of yeah. uvb midday uh to make sure your vitamin d levels are, are good and healthy for your immune system definitely awesome lots to investigate there for people dealing with this and and like you heard john get outside get some vitamin d um so lastly i mean where can some of my audience find you online to get in touch or to purchase your fix your gut book because i know there's a lot of awesome information in there and 
you put a lot of time and research and worked with a lot of people and can help people. So, yes, yeah, so they could, uh, Josh, they can find my work at uh, www.fixyourgut.com. Uh, Fix Your Gut is also on Amazon. It's being sold uh, recently in paperback too as well. Um, I'm also on YouTube. Uh, I used to do a, uh, a, web, a webinar series uh, with my partner, one of my partners at Fix Your Gut, Jason Hooper. Uh, you can find it by search, searching Jason Hooper or Fix Your Gut, the live stream on YouTube to get more information on these certain issues. There's a, a two parts, uh, two hour SIBO uh, um, video out there where we talk about it. Um, but yes, I want to thank you definitely for having me on your podcast today, Josh. Awesome. Yeah. And just so you guys know too, um, we talk mainly about hydrogen sulfide, but he does, he has tons of great information on methane, hydrogen, H. pylori, a lot of different issues that people are dealing with to kind of figure out what's going on and to hopefully get their gut to back to a more normal function. So yeah, really appreciate you coming on. It was fun just being able to chat and kind of dig into some stuff a little bit more. So thank you, Josh. Uh, thank you for having me. I hope your listeners check out my website. Uh, thank you for having me today. All right.